our subject is in the form of a question. We had a question the last two weeks as our subject. You remember that? What was the question? Are we being foolish? That was the question for the last two um, lessons. Our question this evening is, is Abraham our spiritual father? Galatians 3, 5 to 7. Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith, just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness? Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. Let us pray. Our God and our Father, would you help us this evening? Help us one more time as we stand to attempt to teach your people, your people whom you love so passionately and who deserve nothing but the best. Lord God, it's a great responsibility and no man is sufficient for these things. So help us as we look to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. In previous lessons, we have said that in the first five verses of Galatians chapter 3, Paul asks five questions of the Galatian believers. So one question for every verse. Number one, who has bewitched you? Verse one. Number two, did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Verse two. Number three, are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit? Are you now being perfected by the flesh? Verse three. Number four, did you suffer so many things in vain? If indeed it was in vain, verse 4. And number 5, does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Verse 5. By asking these questions of the believers in Galatia, Paul is appealing to their own spiritual experiences. He appeals to their own spiritual experiences in an effort to convince them of their error in departing from the gospel of the grace of God. The essence of Paul's argument in the first five verses of the chapter is that their new position is a contradiction of their own spiritual experiences as well as a contradiction of the gospel. The Galatians had foolishly allowed themselves to be bewitched by the false teaching of the Judaizers who, by their unscriptural gospel-destroying legalistic teaching were undermining the very core of Christianity, namely justification by faith alone in Christ alone. They were teaching the Galatians that in order for them to be true believers, 
they had to become Jewish proselytes and obey the Mosaic law. By asking his questions, Paul is trying to get the believers to recognize that their defection from the gospel of grace contradicts the work of Christ on the cross and contradicts the work of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Brothers and sisters, there is a great gulf that separates authentic Christianity from every other religion in the world. It is the gulf of works versus faith. We could say it another way, the gulf of grace versus law. Every other religion in the world, every single one of them, every single one of them promote a salvation that has to be achieved by us. None of them have a concept of grace. None of them have a concept of one who paid the penalty for the sins of others and who merited a personal righteousness for them which is imputed to them. So without doing anything except believing God, they stand before God perfectly righteous. No other religion in the world has anything even close. Every other religion, you have to work it out. And you have to work it out by yourself. The God may help you to try, but it's really up to you. There is one religion of grace in the world. Why would a Christian who has experienced that work of grace want to repudiate it and work for their salvation like all the other religions? That's a question that we have to ask ourselves. Why would we want to do that? Last week, we said that in verse 5, Paul brings his appeal to the Galatians' own spiritual experiences to a close by one last reminder of how rich their spiritual experiences have been. And not only of how rich their experiences have been, but the way in which God had bestowed on them such wonderful blessings. His fifth question is, does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? In this verse, Paul speaks about the act of the Holy Spirit in endowing the members of the Galatian church with the gifts of the Spirit. Paul's point is that all of the manifestations of the gifts of the Spirit clearly indicate that the grace way of salvation must be God's way, since it is a accompanied by the supernatural ministry of the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 4, 7, Paul asks the believers in Corinth three questions, which he might well have asked the believers in Galatia. For who sees anything different in you? 
What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? What did the Corinthian or the Galatian believers have that they did not receive? What do you or I have that we did not receive? The answer is nothing. Neither in the physical realm nor in the spiritual realm. The gift of the Holy Spirit himself and the gifts that he gives to us are all just that, gifts. They are not wages. They are not something that we earn. We receive them. They are gifts. We didn't work for them. We could not perform works good enough to earn them. So Paul is saying, how do you now allow yourselves to be persuaded? That you have to go back and rely on your works. What is all this that you are up to now? In verse 6, Paul writes, and folks, this is a really very important passage of Scripture. This is this is Theology 101. Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. As we consider this verse, it is important for us to remember that by Asking his five questions of the Galatian believers, Paul is appealing to their own spiritual experiences. They were aware, based on their own experiences, that God had justified them and given them the Holy Spirit when they heard and believed the gospel of grace, and that their ongoing sanctification and their manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit were not the result of their works, but of their faith. In light of the role of faith in their conversion, their sanctification, and their manifestation of spiritual gifts, Paul now cites the experience of the patriarch Abraham, the man of faith, that's what he's called in verse 9, the father of all who believe, Romans 4.11. In his argument, Paul uses the very scriptures which the false teachers we're using to show the necessity of the Galatians being circumcised and keeping the law. Paul is using their own scriptures against them. In effect, Paul is asking the Galatians the question he asks the Romans in Romans 4.3. What does the scripture say? What does the scripture say? What saith the scripture? The first two words of verse 6, just as, just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, just as. This phrase calls the attention of the believers in Galatia to the comparison that Paul is going to make between their experience and the experience of Abraham, as it relates to the matter of justification. 
the Judaizers claim to have the Old Testament on their side. They would have considered Moses to be their preeminent example of how a person attains righteousness. But Paul goes much further back than Moses. He goes perhaps as far back as five centuries and says, let us consider Abraham. Let's not just stop at Moses. Let's go further back. Let's consider Abraham who is the father of the Jewish people. Let us look how he was justified. In answering that question, Paul appeals to the Old Testament as a witness, testifying that justification has always been by faith alone and not ever by works. That's why Paul goes so far back. He could have gone back to Adam, but since he's dealing with the Judaizers who are Jews, he says, let me begin with your father. He says, I'm going to show you, I'm going to cut the ground under your feet entirely. Justification has never been by works. Always by faith. Nobody has ever been saved except by grace. Nobody has ever earned their salvation. Noah was not righteous because he had any personal righteousness. How do we know that? What does the scripture say of Noah? Noah found grace. Noah found grace. It would be more accurate if the scripture had said grace found Noah. Paul quotes from Genesis chapter 15 and verse 6. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. This quotation is one of the clearest statements in the entire Bible about how a person can be justified before God. Abraham believed God. And his belief or faith, rather than his works, was the basis upon which he was declared righteous before God. Martin Luther, the great Protestant reformer, stated, and I quote, Let us begin with Abraham and learn how this friend of God was justified and saved. Not because he left his country, his relatives, his father's house. Not because he was circumcised. Not because he stood ready to sacrifice his own son Isaac, in whom he had the promise of posterity. Abraham was justified because he believed. Abraham was justified because he believed. Are we the children of Abraham? Why does Paul cite the experience of Abraham, an Old Testament patriarch, in a discussion regarding New Testament believers. He's writing to the Galatians. They have been saved under the New Covenant. Why bring up Abraham?
haven't we been told that there are two different ways of salvation? One is an Old Testament way and one is a New Testament way. So if that is so, why would Paul speak about Abraham? Abraham is not relevant. He's an Old Testament man. He was saved under the Old Testament economy. He does so. He cites Abraham because Abraham is the father of the faithful. This is something we need to understand rather than get clear. Abraham is not just the father of the Jewish faithful. He's the father of every faithful person. He is, so to speak, salvation's prototype. Romans chapter 4, verses 9 to 12, and Galatians 3, 28 to 29 clearly indicate that this is indeed the case. And I'm going to read both these passages for us from the English Standard Version. First, Romans 4, 9 to 12. Is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised. That's the Gentiles. So that righteousness would be counted to them as well and to make him the father of the circumcised, that's the Jews, who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. So Paul is saying the fact that he is the father of the circumcised has nothing to do with circumcision. Can I just stir up a little trouble here and read this passage again? Is this blessing then only for the circumcised? I want to start giving trouble a little later. Or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been baptized? It was not after, but before he was baptized. He received the sign of baptism as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still unbaptized. That's enough trouble for one evening. I'll stop there. Let's go to Galatians 3, 27 to 29. I'll have to stir up some trouble with this too. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither is there slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring. He's the father of the faithful. Old Testament faithful, 
New Testament faithful. He's talking to New Testament believers. And he says, if you belong to Christ, you are Abraham's offspring. Heirs according to the promise. No Old Testament salvation different from New Testament salvation. God has saved persons only one way from the beginning of time and it will be so to the end. So all of you who believe that God has a plan for the nation of Israel that bypasses Jesus Christ, I'm sorry for you. All of you who believe that any Israeli can be saved without placing their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and acknowledge, acknowledging him as their Lord and Savior, you are wrong. They cannot, nobody can be saved and bypass Calvary. They cannot be saved by taking up old sacrifices that have been done away in Christ. So you can help them look for red, has, red ashes, of, ashes of red heifer. Brothers and sisters, contrary to what we have been taught, the baptism of which Paul is speaking in this passage is not water baptism. Put in not for me, dear. Not water baptism. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. He's not talking about water baptism, dear. Scratch that from your mind. Erase that from your mind. We are saved by faith apart from any works, including the work of baptism. Baptism in this verse refers to the immersion of the believer into the body of Christ. That's the baptism that Paul is talking about here. This is a supernatural transaction which is accomplished by the Holy Spirit at the time of our conversion. Paul refers to this in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. One spirit we were baptized into one body, placed into one body, immersed into the body. Jews are Greek, slaves are free, and we're all made to drink of one spirit. So when it says, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, it is talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, placing us into Christ and into his body. Truth is that there is and has always been only one plan of salvation. Only one way for persons to be saved. Every person who has ever been justified or declared righteous or saved, either in the Old Testament era or in the New Testament era, has been justified or declared righteous or saved in the same manner by placing their faith in Jesus Christ. They believed God, and their belief or faith was the basis upon which they were justified or declared righteous before God or saved. Those who lived in the Old Testament era were saved by believing or placing their faith in a Christ who was to come. Those who live in the New Testament era are saved by believing or placing their faith in a Christ who has come. Abraham was justified or declared righteous or saved in Genesis chapter 15, more than a decade before he was circumcised. 
and more than 400 years before the law was given to Moses. It is incandescently clear, to use Martin Luther King's word, it is incandescently clear, therefore, that neither circumcision nor the law played any role in his salvation. I hope it will be incandescently clear to us that neither baptism nor rule-keeping played any part in our conversion. As Paul repeatedly stresses in his letters, the doctrine of justification by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, which includes the imputation of the perfect righteousness of Christ, is not merely a divine afterthought following the failure of Israel under the law. So God did not say, oh my God, I didn't know that these Israelites would fail to keep the law. Let me come up with plan B. Let me save them through my son. That's plan B. No. Brothers and sisters, God never has to resort to plan B. His plan A always works. Who can thwart his plan? He's sovereign. The doctrine of justification by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, was the very means by which Abraham, the father of all who believe, was saved. In his commentary on Galatians, John Phillips writes, the point Paul thus makes with the Galatians is clear. The Judaizers were proud of being Abraham's seed. Very well. How was Abraham saved? Simply by believing the Lord. No more, no less. That itself cut the ground from beneath the feet of the Judaizers. But Paul had only just begun. If that was how Abraham was saved, how are all other men saved? On the same principle exactly. If not, if that is not how you were saved, you are not a son of Abraham. So we need to check ourselves. That's why we have asked that question. Are we the sons of Abraham? Is Abraham really our father? How were you saved, brethren? How was I saved? Was I saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone? Or did I have to work hard for my salvation? I'm really asking us, you know. You'd see how many times I'm asking us this question because I don't want to take it for granted and I don't want you to take it for granted. We have to know that we are saved before we die, you know. We, know. we have to know that we were saved in the same way that Abraham was saved. Because if we bypass faith, we are not saved. I don't care what experience you had. Kenneth Wiest makes the following remarks relative to Galatians 3.6. 3, um, Kenneth Wiest is just, for me, just such a great theologian. Of course, he, he died, oh, let me see now, maybe 70 years ago. Thus Abraham believed God, and his act of faith was placed to his account in value as righteousness. This does not mean, however, that Abraham's act of faith was looked upon as a meritorious action deserving of reward. It was not viewed as a good work by God and rewarded by the bestowal of righteousness. That would be salvation by works. But the fact, check, 
work out how you were saved now. But the fact that Abraham cast off all dependence upon good works as a means of finding acceptance with God and accepted God's way of bestowing salvation was answered by God in giving him that salvation. Did we cast off all dependence upon good works? And did we accept God's way of bestowing salvation? Abraham simply put himself in the place where a righteous God could offer him salvation upon the basis of justice, justice satisfied and in pure grace. God therefore put righteousness to his account. He evaluated Abraham's act of faith as that which made it possible for him to give him salvation. Brethren, what work did Abraham do in order to be saved? How were we saved? Did we have to do any work? Listen, I'm never going to be tired of coming to us with this, you know. I'm going to challenge us with this. Justification, we should know this. By the way, folks, you know that we use terms that we can't explain. What is justification? What is atonement? What is salvation? Justification is an act of God, whereby he removes from the believing sinner his or her guilt and the penalty incurred by that guilt. God also bestows a positive righteousness to the believing sinner. That is what J. Gresham Machen was trying to inform us of in the point upon the read by Sister Lisa on Sunday. That positive righteousness is Jesus Christ himself in whom the believer stands not only innocent and uncondemned but actually righteous in point of law for all of time and eternity. There is no religion in the world that provides this other than Christianity. And I'm talking about biblical Christianity because there are some teachings that you stand innocent and uncondemned at the point of your initial salvation, but you can lose it. And I'm saying that's not the gospel. For all of time and eternity, not are you and I only innocent. Not only is it that there is no condemnation, but we are seen by God as positively righteous because we are covered by the righteousness of Christ. This is what God did for Abraham when he believed him. And this is what he does for every sinner who places his or her faith in Jesus Christ for salvation. The Judaizers were attempting to merit this salvation for themselves by their own good works and were inveigling the believers in Galatia to do the same. I had to find a way to put in that word. That was one of my grandmother's favorite words. Don't let them inveigle you. You know that word, right? Did you know it was a proper word? Yes. It is a correct English word. Inveigle. I can hear my grandmother now. 
Don't let nobody inveigle you to think that you can be saved by keeping rules. Paul had been brought up with a rabbinic perspective which held that Abraham was judged righteous because he had been faithful in the time of testing and was consequently rewarded. So the Jews held the view that when Abraham was faithful in what they called the Akedah, the binding of Isaac, because he was faithful that God rewarded him with righteousness. But Abraham, the Akedah, the testing of Isaac, occurred in Genesis chapter 22. But God declared Abraham righteous from chapter 15. When Paul became a Christian, that perspective changed. He became persuaded by scripture that Abraham did not merit the covenant. Instead, the covenant was a promise from God that Abraham accepted by faith. The promises that God made to Abraham are unconditional promises. The promises he made to Israel were conditional promises. He said to Israel, if you do this, then I will do this. If you don't do this, then I will react in this way to you. The promises he made to Abraham were, I will do this. And he passed through the pieces. He cut the covenant and passed through by himself. He didn't ask Abraham to pass through with him. He said, I'm going to take the responsibility to do everything to ensure that this covenant works. John MacArthur points out that, and I quote, it was not the greatness of Abraham's faith that saved him, but the greatness of the gracious Lord in whom he placed his faith. That's, that's a gem right there. It wasn't the greatness of Abraham's faith. It was the greatness of the gracious Lord in whom he placed his faith. If he had great faith in the church, if he had great faith in the pastor, he would still be lost. And that has happened to some people. They place great faith in their pastor And they died as a result. He killed them. Faith, he says, is never the basis or the reason for justification, but only the channel through which God works his redeeming grace. Brothers and sisters, Paul is drawing a conclusion between Abraham's justification and the justification of the Galatians. This, as we pointed out earlier, is obvious from the phrase, just so at the beginning of the verse. Abraham's life is an illustration of the manner in which every human being in Every age is saved, whether old or New Testament, whether Jew or Gentile. This is the conclusion that Paul has arrived at. It is this conclusion that he declares in verse 7, Know then, know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. Know then, based on what he has just quoted from Genesis 15, 6, that Abraham was justified by faith, Paul's conclusion 
is that all who believe as Abraham believed are the spiritual children of Abraham. Again, I say, brethren, we need just to be honest. We need to be honest. If Abraham was not relevant, Paul would not have mentioned him to a New Testament church. And you know that Paul does the same thing to the Roman church in Romans chapter 4. He cites Abraham and then he goes back and cites David who Old Testament men and says to New Testament believers, look at these men. Brethren, do not fall victim to the argument that there is an Old Testament salvation and a New Testament salvation, and the New Testament salvation is different from the Old Testament salvation. There is one salvation. God does not have two plans of salvation, an Old Testament plan and a New Testament plan. Or Paul is either being deceitful by calling Abraham up as a witness, or he's just a failure as a theologian, in which case we can forget about everything he has written. We have to think our way through this, brethren. Paul's use of the word know. See, it begins verse 7, and he says, know then. When Paul uses that word, no, you remember sometimes he asks question, know ye not? His use of the word no in context such as this always points to a truth that his reader should have understood and appreciated, but somehow have failed to grasp. This truth about Abraham being the prototype of salvation. Paul said, you don't know this? Paul is explaining to them that it is evident from the Genesis account that only those who come by faith can be the children of Abraham. The failure of the Galatian believers to understand this obvious truth is very disheartening to Paul. Why is it disheartening to Paul? Can anybody give me one reason why it would be disheartening to Paul? Anybody can give me one reason? Nobody? Nobody? Don't remember anything that we taught? Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed to you as crucified. You don't remember that? Okay. You're just shy. Paul says, in preaching the gospel to you, I drew a picture of the crucified Christ. Paul is per persuaded by scripture. I, I, there's nothing else that can persuade Paul except scripture. And, and, and brethren, that is all that should be able to persuade us, you know. It can't be because Bishop so-and-so said that our apostle so-and-so, I gave him a hundred US and he prophesied this over me, you know. Paul is persuaded by scripture that since Abraham, the father of all who believe, was justified by faith alone, it follows that every one of his offspring must be justified in the same way. In other words, it is those who exercise the same faith that Abraham exercised who are his true followers. 
The expression, those of faith, refers to those who have exercised faith for salvation and whose standing and character are consequently determined by that faith, not by works. The phrase sons of Abraham is, of course, not to be understood as a genealogical sense, but rather in the ethical sense of the term. Abraham, our father, was accepted by God on the basis of faith, and God deals with all Abraham's sons on the same moral, moral basis. He's not a respecter of persons. Thus, the faith exercised by Abraham is declared to be the fundamental condition of acceptance with God for all human beings. All human beings. I think I should read that again. The faith exercised by Abraham is declared to be the fundamental condition of acceptance with God for all human beings. It is on the basis of this truth that I say to us, if we were not saved in exactly the same way that Abraham was saved, we are not saved. If we were saved some other way than by faith alone, in Christ alone, we are not saved. We have worked out something for ourselves. We are not Abraham's children. Abraham's true children are not those who are his natural offspring, the Jews, or those who diligently observe the law or some other system of rule keeping. His natural children are those who simply believe. The New Living Translation renders the verse as follows. The real children of Abraham then are those who put their faith in God, the real children, the real children of Abraham. It seems as if the New Living Translation is telling us you have some unreal children of Abraham. You have some fake children of Abraham. The real ones are those who put their faith in Christ. Brothers and sisters, we sometimes sing, Father Abraham has many sons, Many sons has father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. So let's all praise the Lord. Right hand. Are we really the sons of Abraham? Are we really the sons of Abraham? Is he really our spiritual father? According to Galatians 3.7, the real children of Abraham then are those who put their faith in God. If you know that you are saved by putting your faith in God, stand up, please, and just worship the Lord. If you're not sure, stand and worship too. And say, God, save me. Please save me. Save me like Abraham. It's serious, you know, brethren. It's, it's, it's serious. It's really very serious. Really very serious. Yes. Yes, yes. Sister Denver is coming to pray. And let's let's pray with her and um, we'll come back after she's through. Thank you, Lord. We praise your name. We thank you so much. Thank you that we have the opportunity to be here tonight to hear your word once again. It is such a privilege to hear your word and for faith to be generated in our hearts because of what we hear, what we have read, what we have been taught, Lord God. Thank you that 
you came to our level because we definitely could not, you know, come to your level. We, we were too weak. We were dead. Lord, in trespasses, we and sins, we could not help ourselves. We could not save ourselves. Lord, your love towards us is what has brought us to you. Oh, God. And the more we hear is the more we are humbled and the more we are, we are just in awe. We, Lord, you have to help our unbelief because... We can't imagine. It's so difficult to grasp the kind of love that you have towards us. Oh God, so difficult sometimes to, to believe, to accept it, to, to walk as if we really understand that you have saved us by your grace. That you have loved us so much that you have reached after us. Oh God, but we stand firm on your word. Every day we preach the gospel to ourselves, Jesus. Every day. Every day. Everyone here, every day we remind ourselves. Every day. Thank you, Jesus. Every day. Every day. Oh God. Thank you, Jesus. We need you. Hallelujah. Each of us here, God, we need you. We need you. We need you. We need you. And we are grateful that the love that you have for us is one that will just never let us go. And, you know, as we have heard, if we fall on our face, when we get up back, we are facing you. We're still going in the direction that you would have us to go. We are confident, Lord, that even if things didn't go right today, if we didn't behave right on the job today, if we didn't, you know, represent you well today, God, we are confident that you don't cast us aside. We can, you know, just come and we talk to you. We place it before you. Lord, we ask you to forgive us, even now as we stand here together. We ask that you forgive us of everything we have done that's not pleasing to you, God. Forgive us, Lord. And Lord, help us again. We, we are in a better position, Lord, right now. We know how to live amongst you know, others. We know we have been taught how to live every day, how to be kind to people around us, how to represent you. We have been taught we are much better at doing this. Hallelujah. And for that, we are grateful. We don't have to turn up our nose at others and, you know, we are holier than they are. We understand that we are nothing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so, Lord, we can actually reach out to others. Oh, God, no matter their situation. Hallelujah, because we understand, we are learning, we are understanding day by day. We are not better than them. We are not better. Hallelujah. We are sinners saved by grace. Hallelujah. This is real to us, Lord. We, this is so real to us. We can live better lives representing you. Hallelujah. Understanding that you give us room to grow. Hallelujah. Oh God. Hallelujah. Understanding that what you demand of us, you are the one giving us the energy to do it anyway. Hallelujah. Oh God. So we don't have to be despairing. Hallelujah. And frustrated and overwhelmed. We we'll now get this right. Oh God, we don't have to be hopeless. We don't have to feel that burden that we are the ones working it out. God, this is real to us. Hallelujah. This is real to us. Hallelujah. So tonight as a body... Hallelujah, we are grateful 
Thank you, Jesus, for the words that we are being taught and reminded of every day. We have learned that we can trust your word, the infallible word of God. Whatever you say, whatever it says, we believe it. We can stand on it. And so together as a body of people who have been immersed Hallelujah. In the, our trust, in our faith in you. Oh God, we are grateful. We thank you for what we have heard again tonight, what we have been reminded of. And we look towards tomorrow with hope. Yes, hallelujah. With hope that yes, your mercies are new every morning. Every morning. Tomorrow we can live again. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Tomorrow we can live again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because you live, we can face tomorrow. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We have placed our faith in you. Hallelujah. And that gives us hope for tomorrow. So as we stand here tonight as representatives of so many different sections, we're representatives of the body of Christ, you know, at Grace Workshop Ministry. We're representatives of our families. We're representatives of our co-workers. We're representatives of our schoolmates. God, we stand here as representatives of all those with whom we come in contact. Hallelujah. And we ask, so oh God, tonight together as a body, we ask that you touch our friends, touch our family members, touch our bosses, touch our employers, touch us, oh God, touch our children. Oh God, touch all those with whom we come in contact impact them oh God through us hallelujah thank you God and Lord as we close we don't forget to pray for um, Pastor Bartlett and his family we God are not unaware that not every you know flock is able to receive what we are receiving. And God, we are not ungrateful. Hallelujah. We are grateful. We are grateful. And so God, in turn, we ask that you continue to bless him and his family, Sister Lisa, their children. Oh God, bless their going out. Bless their coming in. Bless them, Lord Jesus, in ways that we don't understand. Breathe upon them, O oh God, from the crown of their heads to the soles of their feet. Bless their home. Bless everything they put their hands to. Bless them today, God. We thank you so much. We are grateful for everything. And as we go home, Lord, we know that you are with us. I pray that we will, even though, you know, we're not reaching for a feeling, but we're trusting your word. We ask that your presence just encompass each person in this place tonight. Every person cover our journeys homeward. Help us to feel that your presence in a real, in a tangible way. Assure that you are the God of everyone, but you're also the God of the individual. So that every individual will feel you. You know, will be assured that you are with them. We worship you tonight as a body. We worship you tonight. Hallelujah. We worship you tonight. We worship you. And, and Lord, we don't forget about those who are tuning in by live stream. Lord, they're a part of this. And Lord, just breathe upon them too as they participate in whatever is happening here tonight. Bless the offering that we'll receive. We trust and rely on you, faithful God. We praise your name. We thank you for everything. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In your precious name, we pray tonight. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus.